today, including mold and mildew. References to leprosy have a different emphasis in the New Testament. They stress God's desire to heal. Jesus freely touched people with leprosy. And while people with leprosy traditionally suffered banishment from family and neighbors, while people with leprosy typically suffered banishment from family and neighbors, Jesus broke that tradition. He treated lepers with compassion, touching and healing them. Although we cannot know, we cannot know all the reasons that God allows disease into our lives. Biblical leprosy is a powerful symbol reminding us of sin's spread and of its horrible consequences. Like leprosy, sin starts out small, but it can then spread leading to other sins and causing great damage to our relationship with God and with others. Amen. Now listen to me. We've even taught it in Sunday school class. I've preached about it. We've, we've talked about the ten lepers that came to Jesus and, and one was made whole when he came back to praise the Lord. And we preach about the lepers, the four lepers uh, of the Old Testament, the book of, of First Kings, I believe it is. And, but the idea that leprosy, please, please receive the word of the Lord this morning. The idea that leprosy caused rotting of the extremities has also been proven false. Now, I know that's going to mess up a whole lot of stuff you've heard all your life from, from Sunday school. Can I get a witness? Amen. While it does cause a gnarling of the hands, a thickening of the ears, and a profuse breaking out on all areas of the body, that's not the reason for the loss of fingers, limbs, etc., the reason for the loss of the limbs and the fingers and the extremities is that leprosy attacks the nerves. And it causes a loss of feeling. And because, because, God, because you can no longer feel pain and you can no longer feel the results of infection, it causes rot, decay, and then loss because they were unaware that their extremities had become infected or hurt or injured. Studying leprosy. Oh, there's a lot of preaching in there. I just don't have time to do it this morning. Studying leprosy helps us see why pain is a valuable gift, a survival mechanism to warn us of danger in this cursed world. Without pain and suffering, we might be like lepers, uh, unable to recognize that something is terribly wrong and that we need the healing touch of God. We would not be aware that we needed something that only God could provide. We would not be aware and we would continue to wander through life, uh, fumbling and bumbling and blind and feeling through, uh, spiritually speaking, uh, and not even know that there was a God that could help us. Dr. Brand, who treated people with leprosy, said, I cannot think of a greater gift that I could give my leprosy patients than pain. Let us not be too quick to remove pain in our lives, whether physical, emotional, social, or spiritual. It may be God's, help me Holy Ghost, it may be God's megaphone to get our attention that something is seriously wrong and that we should run to the one who created us and made us for more than we're living in right now. What I just spoke to you from Dr. Alan Gillen in Answers Magazine, the man in our text is described by the Bible as being full of leprosy. Everybody say full. Full-blown leprosy with all of the accompanying benefits. Leprosy in its most advanced form manifests symptoms which include a hoarse voice with words spoken primarily through the nose. The blood is full of little shiny specks and the face is shining and bloated with frequent hard knobs that are green at the bottom and they're white at the top. The hair cannot be torn away without bringing pieces of the skin with it. And if it regrows, it always regrows white. 
The forehead is grooved with long wrinkle-like cracks. The eyes are red and inflamed and shine like those of a cat. The ears are swollen and red with ulcer-like sores at the bottom. The nose is sunk from the rotting cartilage. The tongue is dry and black with ulcers and furrows and small white spots all over it. The skin is covered with ulcers that die and then revive upon each other and with sometimes with white spots or scales like a fish. And when the skin is cut... There is no blood that comes out. Instead, a pus like serum would run from the skin and the body's members are either rotten or missing and nothing in the body is exempt. It is this pitiful creature that accosts Jesus as he makes his way into a certain city. Unwanted and uninvited. Quite possibly... Quite probably, he sneaked into the city as he was certainly not welcome. It was a cry of unclean. God, help me, Jesus. It was a cry of unclean, unclean that should have been erupting from his leprous lips. But instead, it was, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Leprosy is almost always a type of sin in Scripture. It accomplished physically what sin does spiritually. And usually by an ex- the extension it affects us physically. Notice this. The leper said, if you will, you can. It was never the Lord's ability that was in question. As far as this man has fallen... As pitiful and ostracized as he was, he still recognized that the Lord was able to heal him. And in his own words, his cry was to cleanse me. He can do anything. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He caused the lame to walk, the blind to see. He cast out devils. He can do anything. But the question is... The question is, if you will. If you will. Now I've got to make a couple establishments here. I can back it up scripturally. I want to establish God does not heal everybody. Doesn't. The best example is the Apostle Paul. Had a thorn in the flesh. He sought the Lord thrice. The Lord said, not going to do it. That thorn in the flesh is going to keep you where you need to be, where I can use you more. Trophimus, who the Bible refers to as a fellow laborer of Paul, was left behind by Paul because he was sick and unable to be healed. And then, of course, at Nazareth, which we preached about recently, Jesus was hindered from doing any great great work there because of their unbelief. It's also very important for you to notice or you to realize That you can be saved sick. I said you can be saved sick. Reckon what would happen to our church if we would spend as much time praying for the lost as we do for the sick. You can go to heaven. With one hand cut off. You can go to heaven with an eye gouged out. Matter of fact, Brother Billy, Jesus said it's better for you to be that way if it offends you. Cut it off. You can go to heaven all jacked up in your body. But you cannot continue to sin and be saved. Period. You cannot. You cannot. Now the leper's question is one that we've all asked. We know that you can. The question is, if you will. Now, there's a few reasons why this is important. It's also in Matthew chapter number 8, I believe it is. But Brother David, this is Jesus' first encounter with leprosy. Now there's another message in here we could preach. One of the things that the scribes and the Pharisees and the prophets taught is that when, when the Messiah came, he would heal leprosy. Leprosy was, I don't even know if it's fair to compare leprosy uh, 
because we, we, we've got so much trust and stuff that we put in doctors. But uh, uh, leprosy was kind of like the cancer of, of Jesus' day. And, and, and in some parts of the world, uh, and, and there's another message in there, of course, in, in very, very poverty-stricken areas of the world, leprosy is still being manifest in people's lives. And it's simply called Hansen's disease now instead of leprosy. But this is Jesus' first encounter with leprosy. And, and leprosy symbolized everything that was wrong in the world. And, and their way of dealing with it was when somebody got leprosy, we just get rid of them. Till Jesus showed up. It's his first encounter with this dreaded disease and, and it will testify of his power and his authority. It was possibly the most dreaded, all probability the most dreaded thing that could happen to someone is they could be told you have leprosy. So what exactly does he mean when he says, if you will? I've already painted you a picture. The Bible tells us, Justin, that he's full of leprosy. Which there may have been a thing or two, Sister Maria, that hasn't happened yet. But for the most part, he's probably got it all. And he shows up in a certain city. And if you study and understand, lepers were not allowed to go into normal cities. They had leper colonies, in fact, where they would, they would just be able to be together with their own kind. But somehow a leper who's full of leprosy, whose body is stricken, who it's very evident he doesn't belong, comes to Jesus and he says, if you will, you can make me clean. So what does he mean, if you will? If you will, you can. It may be better understood as a desire, which can also be stated as, do you want to? And it is also subjective when you look at it in the Greek, subjective to each situation. I know you can, but will you cleanse me? So the focus is not, do you want to clean somebody? It is, do you want to clean me? I know, I know you can. I know you're able. My faith says you can. Where I've got the hang up is, uh, where I've got the problem at, where I'm having the struggle at, is will you do it for me? And the Bible says... I had to go back and read to read this because I wanted to, oh Lord, I wanted to make sure that it was, I had it right in my mind. And the Bible says, Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. And he's unclean. He is unclean. What's the big deal about him touching him? It's so important that this happened first. Because when Jesus reached out and touched the leper, it removed a stigma, at least as it was between Jesus and the leper. It was a touch that soothed him. It was a touch that says, I, I care about you. It was a touch that says, your circumstances do not intimidate me, nor does the public's perception intimidate me. But more importantly than all of that is it was a personal touch. It wasn't a general touch, but it was a personal touch. It let him know that this is between us. I want to let you know something this morning, that what you're feeling is not the splash over of somebody else's vessel that's spilling out on you, but it is a personal touch from the power of the Holy Ghost. The Lord knows who he's putting his hand on. The Lord knows who he's touching. The Lord knows who he's got a hold of. Oh, you got to hear the word of the Lord this morning. It's not just something that fills this place. And I agree there's a certain level of emotion, but it is a personal experience, encounter with the God of Israel. It's personal. It's specific. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost right now. It's not just because you happen to be in this place, but the hand of the Lord is on you because He wants to touch you. Yeah. 
Oh, to be like Jesus. Oh, when I read this and I started writing these notes, there was such a longing, Brother David, that came over me to be like Jesus. To walk in such confidence and walk in such authority, but more importantly, to walk in such love that nothing matters. Nothing else matters. It was against the law for Jesus to touch the leper. The leper had no business being there. He was wrong. He was out of line. He was violating law. But when the Lord touched him, the enemy's going to try to sell you a bill of goods. The enemy's going to try to convince you. And, and please excuse me if you think I'm being, uh, I'm being I, I don't know what the word is, may, maybe uh, 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 assuming too much. Uh, but as I prayed this morning, uh, as I prayed this morning, I, I prayed not just for the people, not just for the people that you can look at them and tell that they need deliverance from the Lord, uh, but I prayed also for the ones that still on the inside, uh, making its way to the extremities. Uh, I prayed for those uh, who uh, aren't even fully aware because they have become so desensitized to the things they have allowed into their lives and they have allowed to surround them and one of them is doing just the opposite of what Jesus did. We have got to be aware and understand that if we're going to go to heaven it's not going to be on our own merit or on our own example or the example of the person that you respect the most. It is going to be because you've got enough faith in God to reach out and touch a leper. I will never, I will never, never sing the song with the same meaning that I used to sing it with. He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. Ah. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that too often we're waiting on the good part. When the good part's already happened, it's when the hand of the Lord reached down and touched you. And when He touched you, He was saying, I will. He was saying, I will. He was saying, I will. How many people are still coming to church because they like what they feel? But they sit off in a corner unaware, unaware. They think they just kind of get, like I said earlier, some spillover, some slop over when the Holy Ghost bubbles out of somebody. But that's not true. That's what the enemy wants to make you think. Uh, the enemy wants to make you think. Remember, remember the lady that she asked the Lord for something to eat. Uh, and he said, the Lord's food's not for the dogs. Uh, and she said, I'll be... She said, I'll be satisfied because even the dogs get a few crumbs. we got to get rid of that mentality. You didn't come here for crumbs. You didn't come here for... You didn't come here for crumbs. You didn't come here for scraps. You didn't come for a few sprinkles off of somebody else. You came to get everything that God has for you. And I come to let you know that it is His will. And he touched him. He touched him. And the Bible said that he said, I will be thou clean. And the leprosy departed from him. I will. The word of the Lord says to us this morning, you know I can. You know I can. Can I convince you that I will? The mission of the Spirit is, according to Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18, verse number 19. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the mission. That is the mission of the Spirit. 
is to invade the lives of people and change them. To heal. To preach the, the, the gospel to those who have not. To, to heal those who are broken hearted. To preach deliverance to those that are bound up. Uh, and recovering of sight to those that are, that are blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Uh, of course God is able to do this in the flesh and in the natural. But the truth of the matter is uh, that this is a spiritual proclamation. That when the Spirit of the Lord gets on you, uh, He wants to heal you. Uh, because that is His mission. I don't know that we fully understand the mission of the Holy Ghost. We leave too many things to chance. Uh, I want to just interject this right now while I can. If there's anything in your life, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual, etc., that stands between you and salvation, it is the will of God that it be gone, and it is the will of God that it be gone today. Because uh, there's nothing can stand between you and being saved. It's not a matter if He can. It's a matter of if He wants to. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. This second epistle, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For all things, excuse me, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things, everybody say all things. All things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. So in the last day, we live there now. I read something this morning. I don't know if I can remember it verbatim, but I can give you the gist of it. Somebody shared something about baptism in Jesus' name, the essentiality of it. And... Uh, Somebody was trying to argue that Jesus' name baptism is not essential. And when they said, well, that's what the way they baptized everybody in the New Testament was in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, uh, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of the Father is, uh, is Jesus, and the name of the Son is Jesus, and the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Uh, John 5, 43, Matthew 1, 21, John 14, 26. Uh, you know, it's the name of Jesus Christ. And this lady says... And this lady says, uh, she says, well, the New Testament don't say that I, can't, that I can drive a red car, so if I do, I ain't going to hell. What color car you drive ain't got nothing to do with your salvation. But people want to make fun and they want to ridicule in the last days. Uh, and they want to ridicule truth. And they want to rid ridicule the gospel. And they want to ridicule a life change. But i got to let you know something. Those scoffers are going to come. They are here even right now making fun and ridiculing. Listen to me just a second. And they're saying there ain't nothing changed uh, since the beginning of creation. Everything stayed the same. Where is the promise of His coming? And when I read that, Sister Maria, I got so excited because I can stand up and testify to you today, I know one thing that's changed, and that's this old boy. I'm not the same as I used to be. I'm not the same as I was when my mama gave birth to me. When the Holy Ghost came on me, it changed me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I don't think like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I don't walk like I used to. And I don't feel like I used to. I know something that's been changed. I know something that's not the same as it always has been. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old song said, I've been to the water and I've been baptized. My soul got happy and I'm satisfied. And I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Just like the Bible, just like the Bible said. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
We the church, listen to me now well. The mountains may not have changed. The rivers and the streams may not have changed. But we've got to stand up and let the world know that there is something that's changed and it's the church of the living God. It is people that are bought by the blood of Jesus, washed and cleansed by His blood and His power that repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost still changes people. Everything in their lives may... Oh, goodness. Everything in their lives may be the same. Everything in their world may be the same. But I know I've been changed. Children, I know I've been changed. Yes, I know I've been changed because the angels in heaven done sign my name. I said, I know I've been changed. Children, I know I've been changed. Yes, I know I've been changed. Man. Rejoice not that the devils are subject to you. For I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. But rejoice rather that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I've been changed. I've been newborn. All my life has been rearranged. That's why, saints of God, we can't act like the world. We can't look like the world. We can't talk like the world because I've been changed. 2 Peter chapter 3. I know you can. I know you can, if you will. Now, if I had my will, if I had my way, I probably wouldn't be up in front of you today. I'd be sitting beside you. There'd be another feller up here preaching. If I had my will. If I had my will 19 years ago, my daddy wouldn't have died, Brother David. I don't understand it still. His ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. And there are just some things that we have to accept as the will of God. But he told Paul, and I cling to it myself, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul said, and when I'm weak, then am I strong. So some things are, are his will. We don't, we don't understand them and we can't fathom them and... And they don't fit into our life and they don't fit into our, our realm of, of thinking. But he knows the end from the beginning. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. What does that mean? <laughs> that means don't get in a hurry. There's still a God up there that's in control. And He don't march to your calendar. He don't march to your clock. He, tell, he tells the sun when to get up in the morning. And He tells the moon when to hang out and shine. Don't get too, well, God ain't done it yet. And I've been praying. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, let me tell you something. Don't pull your jewelry off and build you no calf because Moses ain't come down from the mountain. You can rest assured if he went up, he's coming down. You can rest assured if the Lord started a work in you, he will complete that work in you. He is faithful. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here right now. God have mercy. Don't you get impatient. Don't you get to chomping at the bit. You understand the Bible says wait. I say wait patiently upon the Lord. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength.